Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. So today we're going to be talking about the lambda phage and its decision making process. So we're going to be looking at lytic and lysogenic growth. So let's just dive right in. We're going to start with this image here. So essentially what we're looking at is infection of a bacteriophage into a host cell. And upon this infection, we can see that there are two outcomes that we observe, and those are lytic growth and lysogenic growth. So if you don't already know what those are, I'll just go through them right now. Lytic growth is essentially where the bacteriophage exploits the host's machineries and resources to multiply itself and create more bacteriophages. And after that, the cell, the host cell is ruptured where all these new bacteriophages that have been created are released and they can go on to infect more host cells. So that is lytic growth and lysogenic growth, as you can see here, is a little bit different. And this is where the host genome is being basically integrated with this phage genome, which is known as the prophage. And... Uh, as you can see, there are little red dots that are called lambda repressors, and we will get into that in a second. But this is general overview of what's going on here, so let's just jump on into some of the new information. So we're going to start here. This is um, a very general picture to give you context, essentially. We're looking at a circular genome. We see all these different promoters, all these different um, genes that we're going to express, and we're going to get into all of this. This looks very muddy right now, but hopefully by the end of this video, a lot of these things will make sense. So today, I, I want to start with these three promoters, actually. So we know we're looking at either lytic growth or lysogenic growth, right? Those are our two options that we can go into. So there's different promoters that will start to express different proteins that will put us into those scenarios, right? So we have something called PR and PL, so leftward promoter, PL, rightward promoter, PR. The names are pretty self-explanatory. And these express their respective proteins. So PR, if you look at this image, PR, as you can see, expresses rightward or downstream, and it's expressing crow, something called crow, which we'll get into in a bit. And our PL is expressing leftward and it expresses something called N which isn't shown here and N is known as anti-termination. So essentially what anti-termination is is that when we have a polymerase that is transcribing it will normally stop when it is indicated to do so, right? It stops at a stop signal. But when we have anti-termination, what that means is it's going to skip the stop signal and go further. So you end up with a longer transcript. Now, if we look at PRM, this is in the middle in between PR and PL, and it expresses leftward as well, and it expresses something called CI. CI is also known as lambda, the lambda repressor. The names, those two names are interchangeable. So if I say CI or lambda, I mean the same thing. So one thing I want you to just, I just want to lay some groundwork with you here first. PR and PL, I want you to associate these two promoters with lytic growth, okay? If we have PR and PL working, we're in lytic growth. And if we have PRM working here, we're dealing with lysogenic growth, okay? So another thing I want, just a little side detail, which we will come back to. This isn't absolutely crucial in this point in time. But PR and PL are very strong promoters. And that will come back in a second. We can just put this information in our back pocket for now. But PR and PL are strong and PRM is a weak promoter. And that will come back to full circle. It'll exp help explain some things. So let's just take the basics that we've established and go one step further with it, right? So we know we have these promoters, PR, PL, PRM, and they express their respective protein, uh, CRO, N, CI, also known as lambda, okay? Something that we're going to add here, just another layer, is that these 
promoters have operator sequences. So there are three operator sequences, as you can see in this image, OR1, OR2, and OR3. And depending on what promoter we have expressing, right, depending on if we're in lytic or lysogenic growth, so depending on if we have PR and PL or PRM expressing their proteins, we're going to see binding from these proteins at these operator sequences at different affinities. So that is a very loaded sentence. Um, let's just break that down really quick here. So let's take our scenario. If we have PR expressing crow, right? PR expressing rightward to make crow. Crow, as you can see that I've listed, crow binds to OR3 with the highest affinity. OR3 is the highest affinity as opposed to OR2 and 1. But those two are relatively the same affinity. Okay, crow binds to OR3 with the highest. Conversely, if we have PRM expressing CI, so expressing leftward making CI, CI it binds to OR1 with the highest affinity. So it's basically the opposite of crow, what it does here. The binding sites, I should say. It binds at the opposite end uh, with highest affinity. So what that does, we'll get into that in a second. But I want you to first notice from this image that our promoters are, you know, conveniently overlapping with these operator sequences. And that does something here. So our PR, as you can see, it overlaps with OR1 and our PRM overlaps with OR3. Okay, so let's just break this down now. If we have PR expressing crow, and crow binds with highest affinity at OR3, like I mentioned, it is essentially in the way of PRM. It's binding where PRM is located. It is blocking it, basically, right? So when we have our RNA polymerase, once that gets introduced here, it's not going to go at PRM, because the PRM is completely blocked off by crow right now. So where's the only place it can go? the other promoter, PR, right? Because it's open. So it's going to bind there and it's going to express rightward and we're just going to make more crow and we're going to stay in the lytic cycle. That's basically what's happening. And that means crow did its job. It wants to stay lytic, right? So if we look at the other side of the coin, PRM expressing CI, CI would be binding at OR1 with the highest affinity. And by doing this, it is over OR1 overlaps with PR as you can see and because it's binding at OR1 because our lambda repressor or CI is binding there it is blocking essentially PR it's in its way and RNA polymerase will not go there it can't because it's completely blocked off so it's going to go at the other promoter that's available there PRM and then it's going to do that and it's go it's going to express leftward to make more CI or more lambda repressor, and it's going to keep it in lysogenic growth, okay? So I know that sounds like a lot of information. I will show you a couple of visuals here in a second, and hopefully that will help you digest what I just said. So this is the first image that I want to show you. As you can see, this is lytic growth. This is what lytic growth looks like. We have crow being expressed. Crow, we said, binds at OR3 with very high affinity, and it is blocking PRM, right? And then, as you can see, our RNA polymerase, it goes to PR. That's where it's going, and it's going to go express rightward where crow is. So that's the direction we're going in, and we are staying in lytic growth. That's what that looks like. And if we look here... I just want you to direct your uh, attention to the bottom there. That is what lysogenic growth looks like. This is not as labeled as my other image, but I will still go through this with you. We have PRM making CI, right? We're expressing CI. CI is binding at OR1 with the highest affinity. It's not labeled, but that's where it is. And it's also binding at OR2 cooperatively. And as you can see, there's a bunch of these and they are tetramerizing. So I want you to look on the right side here. This is just like a, almost like a, a little bit of an anatomy of the lambda repressor of CI. There's a DNA binding site, an activating region, a tetramerization region, 
And if you overlay this image on the right with how they're positioned on the bottom there in the red image, you can see that they're attaching to the DNA with the DNA binding region. They are activating one another and tetramerizing or interacting with their tetramerization region. So you can see their, their anatomy is almost fully aligned with one another, right? And the very closest lambda to the RNA polymerase is actually interacting with it, as you can see. They are touching there. It is activating it. So RNA polymerase is going to end up going leftward from PRM, and we're going to keep getting CI. So here we see that CI tetramerizes. And if you go back to my other image there, crow does not look the same as lambda. Okay, lambda almost looks like a little dumbbell. Crow is just a little dimer. Crow stays as a dimer, it dimerizes, and CI, or lambda, tetramerizes, as you can see. So that's what I want you to distinguish between those two. And if you look at the top here, we see a couple of new things that might cloud your uh, knowledge with C2 and PRE and C2 binding site, and that looks very confusing, but we will get into it in a second. So this is just a close-up of that previous image there. So let's talk about C2 and PRE. So we know we have PR, PRM, PL, and they do their thing that we've just established this whole time, right? Now, if we take our story from the top, if we have infection from a bacteriophage to a host cell, right? I want you to remember that I said PR and PL are very strong promoters, and PRM is a weak promoter, right? And that's where this comes in. Upon infection, we are immediately, right off the bat, going to start with lytic growth. Because PR and PL are such strong promoters, right off the bat, those are going to express their proteins. So, boom, PR is expressing crow, as you can see at the top, right? And not only are we expressing crow, we see we, we're going further than that. We're passing PRE, we're expressing C2 as well. So this little collection here on the right, PRE, C2, C2 binding site, the, these things are, these are very unstable things that we're dealing with now. We're entering into very unstable territory. So C2, it needs to bind to C2 binding site. It has a full on binding site for it because it's pretty unstable. And it's also very close to our PRE, so another promoter. In the middle here, as you can see in this middle picture, PRE is expressing leftward, and we'll get into that in a second. But it needs C2 to bind at the C2 binding site first. Um, and this is because PRE is an extremely weak promoter, okay? So because it's so weak, it needs C2 to bind at the C2 binding site, and this is basically what's going to help position RNA polymerase at PRE so that it can properly go express leftward and transcribe whatever it's going to do in a second that I will get into. Does that make sense? I'm hoping this is making sense with this image here and that you're following along. So it's very unstable. It binds to the C2 binding site. C2 is unstable binding there. That's where it's going to position RNA polymerase because PRE is also very weak. And so now we see expression leftwards, right? We see it passing crow, but we're not making crow. We're actually making antisense crow here, right? Because we're going in the opposite direction. And we're also passing along CI. So we're making CI. We're making our lambda repressor, right? And if we have enough CI being made, remember, what does CI do? CI, if we follow along to the bottom image now, CI, like we said, binds to OR1 with super high affinity, right? It's going to bind to OR1 slash OR2 cooperatively, and therefore it's blocking PR, right? That's what we said it does. It's doing its job. And so because PR is now being kind of blocked, this is where our RNA polymerase is going to position at PRM instead, and it's going to make more CI. We're going to ex we're going to start transcribing leftward, so we're getting more CI, and we're in lysogenic growth now, right? So this is kind of where the switch happens. If we're making crow, we're in the lytic cycle, as we said at the top, 
right off the bat upon infection you're usually gonna get expression of crow because pr is so strong and pl which isn't shown in this picture but because they're such strong promoters we're starting off in the lytic but the switch happens because of c2 essentially our c2 if it's it's very unstable and unreliable, but if it is binding to the binding site and positioning polymerase at PRE, we're going to start making CI. And if we're making enough CI, like I said, it's going to block PRM because of the whole process we just went through. It's going to block PRM because it binds there with very high affinity at OR1. And now we're in lysogenic growth. We're making CI now. So that's basically the gist of it. That's kind of how it goes. This image is a really good summary. If you can kind of almost tell the story to yourself following along with this image, then you definitely have a good grasp. Okay, so we're back with our circular genome that we started with. So as you can see at the top here, these all these promoters, PR, PRM, PRE, we've just broken them down a bit, right? All these little sequences here, N, crow, all that stuff, they make a lot more sense now, right? Another thing that I want you to start looking at here, because there's obviously other things on this genome, um, I want you to direct your attention to the left side, where you can see something called excisionase and integrase and P1, which is their respective promoter, that's it. Um, basically, these are associated with lys the lysogenic cycle, these um, genes, these sequences, right? And this is because, I just want you to logic this out really quick. We said lysogenic growth is where we have integration of the phage genome into the host genome, right? That's where it stays there, and it's known as the prophage. So in order to do that, we need proteins like it integrase and excisionase that's what that is useful for so naturally they're associated with the lysogenic cycle so this left side here we're going to associate this left side with the lysogenic cycle and if we move on to the right we see q we see labeling that says lysis proteins head genes tail genes this is all lytic cycle stuff okay because, like I said, the lytic cycle, we said it's associated with, it concerns itself with exploiting the host and making more phages, right? We're making new phages. So we need head genes and we need tail genes because we need to make new phage heads and tails because we're making more, we're duplicating, we're multiplying. So obviously the right side here is going to be associated with the lytic cycle. So this is essentially we've covered the whole genome here and we kind of have an idea of what does what um, so that is basically all that we have now so that's all for today i hope that that explained everything that you need for your exams on this topic be sure to like this video and to comment below if you have any other questions relating to the lambda phage or if you have any other video topics that you would like Brain Boost to cover, and we will cook that up for you in the next video. Uh, also, be sure to subscribe to this channel for more content and hit the bell notification uh, just so you can get notified anytime that we post.